It is time for another edition of the KSO Show, which is brought to you by People State Bank and Legacy Insurance. I am by myself, kind of. Natalie Hall, Red Hall are here with me, but they don't want to come on the podcast. So just me today, Derek Young is out watching a high school football game. I'm giving Grant Flanders a much-deserved Friday off. Logan wanted to come, but not if his friends weren't here. So it is just me. We're going to try a one-man episode of the KSO Show. Fortunately, there's a lot to talk about. So even though you'll have to hear me a lot, at least it has a chance to be interesting. It's a bye week, of course, for K-State football, or an off week, as I prefer to call it. Either way, I'm going to start with basketball, because it is the bye week for K-State, and there's a lot to talk about with basketball, uh, especially around with re- recruiting, but practice starting as well. The big news, really, of the day and the week for K-State is the commitment of Davion Bradford, a seven-foot big man from St. Louis, uh, Rivals 150 member, the fourth 150 commit for K-State in this class. I'll get to that in a second. But I want to talk about Davion Bradford specifically first. A guy who had a number of Power 5 offers, committable ones for sure. The battle really probably came down to K-State and Missouri for this one at the end. Those are the two schools that felt like they had the best chance. K-State obviously had the best chance of anyone to get the, to get Davion Bradford. The Wildcats have felt pretty good about this for probably about a week before this became official. So not a surprise to them, but certainly good news. Again, this is a, a high three-star player. 133rd best player in the country at the moment on Rivals.com. Seven foot 260 is what he's listed at. If you look at him, he's really changed his body type over the last year or so. He was a guy who who did have some bad weight on him for a high school basketball player. You look at him now, you don't see a lot of that. There's still work to do, of course. He's not an elite athlete, um, but he's got a lot of size, of course. He's seven foot, a lot of length. And if you'll read Grant Flanders' What It Means story about the uh, commitment on KSO, I'm not going to give it all away because, of course, as I say every single time we talk here, we'd love to have your business. But this is a guy who shot about 70% from the floor, a lot of dunks, only about 40%, a little above 40 from the free throw line. So he has some work to do there. Averaged over 11 boards a game, over two blocks a game. Kind of a traditional center, but one that a lot of schools wanted. K-State's really, really happy to have Davion Bradford in this class. If you're looking at this more big picture, Bradford is now the fourth Rivals 150 commit in this class, joining Nigel Pack, Luke Kasubke, and Selton Miguel. That's the order they committed in. Of course, Nigel Pack and Selton Miguel, both four-star players. Bradford and Kasubke, three stars, all in the 150. We did some lurking Flanders did before I did. This is the first time K-State has ever had four Rivals 150 players in the same recruiting class. The previous best was three, uh, which happened back when I believe it was excuse me, Rodney Magruder. Wally Judge and Nick Russell. So a class that, you know, Wally Mag- or, uh, Rodney Judge, of course, one of the – Rodney Magruder, of course, one of the better players in K-State basketball under Bruce Weber. The other two didn't have as big a career as at least the K-State both transferred away, but that was a good class. That was part of a Big 12 championship with Rodney, Magr- Rodney Magruder being a big part of that, of course. So this is one of the better classes, probably the best class Bruce Weber has signed at least since last year. You've got last year's you had Dejuan Gordon – the highest-rated player K-State had, has had under Bruce Weber signed, Montavious Murphy, a number one, another 150 player. I wrote this today in a column for a site, so you may have seen this. Sorry if you've if you've read that and heard this and being repetitive. But uh, K-State last year, when they won the Big 12, had two players on its roster who were 150 players at a high school, that being Dean Wade and Xavier Sneed. Xavier Sneed's still on the team next year. This team will have, when I say next year, I mean really this year since practice has started. We're going to talk about that here in a second. Um, but now they'll have three on this year's team, and then as many, well, they'll have six as currently constructed on next year's team. So being a Rivals 150 player does not guarantee success, just like it doesn't mean you can't be successful if you're outside of it. You look at guys like Cam Stokes and Barry Brown, neither when they're 150, both were great players. So there's no sure thing just because of a name by, by a recruiting ranking, but you have to be, be excited about it. You're going to see a lot more team coverage coming up on KSO. Thanks to Grant Flanders and Logan Mance. They've again requested individual availabilities every week with the players, and they've got it, so I appreciate the efforts on that. The latest one on the site was McCall Wayne. I know the two, meaning Flando and, and Logan, have talked to Cartier Jada and Antonio Gordon. They think they have two really good stories coming on those. Uh, you'll see as well. We know we're going to have a basketball availability as an entire media with K-State. Really, K-State's Basketball Media Day will be October 16th. That's this coming Wednesday. Then you've got Big 12 Media Days, two Wednesdays out, October 23rd. So loads of opportunities to talk to all the players, K-State's coaches. You'll see shots of them in their their new uniforms. It'll be exciting to see, I'm sure. We don't have an exact date, at least one that we can share uh, on an open practice that you're going to have. But typically around this time of the year, you'll see a football game pop up on the schedule pretty soon that has an open practice that fans can go to. We'll see if that happens. Keep an eye out for that because we'll have coverage of that for sure with at least probably Grant Flanders. Maybe Chris Nelson, maybe KSU underscore fan. That's Jimmy for those who don't know. But you're going to have a chance to go to that too. So keep an ear out for that. We'll let you know when that practice becomes open so you have a chance to head out there. 
Like I said, practice has been going under, uh, has been underway for about two weeks now. It feels like it's a year-round thing. K-State started practice, I want to say September 23rd, late September. We already have an exhibition coming up on October 25th against Aporia. That's, that's crazy to me. Big 12 Media Days on the 23rd. Two days later, you see K-State play an exhibition game at home against Emporia. It's going to be exciting to get there and watch the Wildcats. Of course, this is a team that we've talked about a ton. We'll be excited to see where they're picked in the Big 12. On one hand, they basically have three starters back. You know, three multi-year starters, really, in McCall Wayne, Xavier Sneed, and Cartier Jada. You know, off a team that's gone back-to-back -back years to the NCAA tournament. They've won the Big 12. They've been to three straight tournaments. They've been to an Elite Eight. A lot of schools to get picked in the top four, top three in the league with that much experience back. I think K-State might be more in the four to five range. We'll wait and see on that. It's going to be interesting, but it'll be a very fascinating season to cover. Now you have this recruiting class, of course, on top of it, which makes it an interesting time for K-State basketball. The regular season will not officially open until November 5th against North Dakota State in Manhattan, but even that's not far away. We're sitting here, you know, almost mid-October, so November 5th, K-State will play its first regular season basketball game of the year against North Dakota State. Let's wrap up the segment of basketball. Again, we're taking one more look at this recruiting class and what it means for K-State. Let me kind of lay out what the foundation looks like right now. So you already know you have a, a commitment from point guard Nigel Pack, four-star play in the Rivals 150. K-State loves him. He's the guy who really started this class out. They made it really, really clear to us they wanted Nigel Pack um, in the fold by July. They got that to happen. It really spurred the rest of the class. So you got your point guard there. You've got a shooting guard in Luke Kazuki. listed at 6'4". He's held us. He's as tall as 6'6". Six, six. So this is probably a guy with some 2 3 versatility. So you've got your point guard, you've got your two, who can also play a three. Then you're looking at Selton Miguel, who currently is the highest rated player in the class. He is a four star player in this group, uh, top 150, like all of them, of course. He's by trade probably a natural three, but he could also put, slide down and play the four. Not necessarily an, a, a, even that similar of a player to Xavier Sneed, but perhaps will have the same positional versatility that Xavier Sneed had for K State. You skip the four spot. There's nobody really there other than, of course, Selton Miguel, who can help out of the four. And now you have a five. You know, of course, in Davion Bradford, seven-footer, like I said, out of St. Louis. The only spot you don't have there is a really a true four. The nice part when you look at the core of this program is they have two fours in last year's class, both at Antonio Gordon and Montavious Murphy. And then the highest-rated player of all these guys in the seven, eight-person core I'm talking about for K-State, Dejuan Gordon. Has played some at the one, has played some at the two. He's really naturally a three. He can play some at the four. So you're going to have a lot of positional versatility. Not just highly rated guys, but guys that fit into the system for what Bruce Weber's looking for. Of course, you look at guys, a class, I wrote this in the column today, like Barry Brown, Dean Wade, Cam Stokes. That's the best class Bruce Weber has signed because of what they did on the floor. But from a peer rankings perspective, this class is better than that. They have a better core than they had with all the success they've had the last four years. So will be a very, very, very fun season to follow and recruiting still to follow. I don't think they're done. They may sign a fifth person. They only had room for three, so they're already one over. For them to take a fifth, it would need to be a very, very good player and a player at a position of need, possibly a big. Jethro Muscadden, of course, is the name to look for there, but he's not the only one they're talking to. We're going to wrap up segment one of the KSO Show. I'm at Tallgrass Tap House. That's where we're recording. It is brought to you by Peel State Bank and Legacy Insurance. When I come back for segment two, we will talk K-State football. I'm going to go position by position and look at what we've learned about the Wildcats. I'm going to break down the rest of the schedule and give you my prediction for the season and spend a little bit of time talking football recruiting as well. This is the KSO Show, presented by People's State Bank and Legacy Insurance. I am back for segment two of this edition of the KSO Show, which is brought to you, as always, by People's State Bank and Legacy Insurance. I'm here at Tallgrass Tap House in Manhattan on points. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Uh, segment one and segment two included a meal between them. I have eaten now, so if I rushed segment one talking about hoops, I was probably hungry, and I apologize for it. It's no good excuse. I shouldn't have done it, but it's what happened. I'm going to tell you what we all got, because I'm sure you're very interested in that, but I think I bet Tallgrass would appreciate it. Red got some barbecue shrimp because it has very mature taste. He also got an ice cream uh, shake and has chocolate all over his face. Nat's got lettuce wraps. I got the Korean fried wings. It's a pretty good place. We're also, and this is not a lie, I'm not just selling this. We're going to go to one of our other sponsors tomorrow night, which is Bourbon and Baker. We have some friends coming in town. Nat's and I are going to go. And if you show up at Bourbon and Baker and say hi to us, that'd be a great time. So let's get to talk about some sports, though. Let's talk football during the off week again. K-State's second off week already of the season. The first one came after a 3-0 start and a very exciting one at Mississippi State. This one not nearly as fun off of back-to-back -back losses, 26-13 to Oklahoma State, then 31-12 to Baylor last week. I'm going to get back into the habit. I'm just going to go position by position, share some thoughts I have. Some might be longer than others at particular spots, but it's a good way to keep me organized and keep me 
on some bit of a track here as I'm by myself. So let's look at quarterback first. I think the biggest thing to talk about there, like everybody wants to do, is how is Skylar Thompson playing? That's the big question. There's a wide variance of opinion between how big of a part of the problem, you know, quote unquote, is Skylar Thompson with K-State's offensive struggles. And the thing I've continued to say is he is part of the problem, of course. There's nobody immune to this. He is not playing, you know, great football that's carrying teams to win in Big 12 play. So as I defend a guy like Skylar Thompson, it's not to say he's doing enough to win games because he he's probably not right now for K-State. I just think it's a situation as we get to talking about other positions. I think there are more problems elsewhere quite a few of them that are causing issues but Skyler Thompson does need to play better for K-State he does need to be more confident and find a way to trust people to get open and and find those openings when they come about and find a way to del deliver the ball to the receiver he did it well last week at times but really he struggled as the game was still in doubt um, to find guys and make big plays in the passing game you guys already know that John Holcomb has left the program of course that's something that we talked about I mean I guess two weeks ago at this point Nick Ost will be the number two quarterback Jaron Lewis still working as a little bit the scout team and then as K-State's number three quarterback expect him to redshirt Chris Heron is not moving back to quarterback don't even worry about that that's something I asked about pardon me and there was not a lot of interest in that I think because Chris Heron's doing so well wide receiver there's not that he can't play quarterback necessarily but he's found his home Will Howard of course committed at the position from Pennsylvania so K-State's still fine at that spot big picture probably not going to try to add a second commit in this class even after John Holcomb's departure We'll wait and see on that. Moving on to running back, uh, Jordan Brown, I think we, well, we were the first to report it. Derek Young was uh, reported his injury before the Baylor game. We held it out till that Saturday morning and then let it go on Powercat game day and on Derek's uh, final walk through on, walk through on KSO. Um, we knew at that point Jordan Brown would miss a significant amount of time. When I say significant, I just mean multiple games, not necessarily longer than that. Um, there was, of course, some speculation kind of about Jordan Brown possibly redshirting. That didn't really come from K-State. Uh, that just came, you know, from people looking at the possibility of it. You don't get the sense at all that is K-State's intention, intention to redshirt Jordan Brown or Jordan Brown's preference to stay in redshirt. Um, he could be back probably as soon as the Oklahoma game. That might be even a little bit fast. But if it's the Oklahoma game, you're still back for five games of the season, really six games of the season. I guess if you think about it, there'd be six left at that point. So not a situation where it's likely he's going to redshirt. Pretty easy to figure out that he could. Um, you just got to look at the North Carolina page and see that he did play as a true freshman right after signing out of high school. So he certainly is eligible to redshirt. He's only played four games this year. I wouldn't expect that. Beyond that, you're looking at James Gilbert continuing to look at not putting the football on the ground, which he's had a bit of an issue with. Uh, nice story from Ryan Black in the Manhattan Mercury. He talked about James Gilbert was not a fumbler at Ball State. He put it on the ground. I don't want to steal the stats from Ryan, but it was something like only a couple times and around 600 touches. So it was very, very rare for him there. It has been a problem here at K-State, though, so that needs to slow down for him. You saw some Joe Irvin last week against Baylor. I think he's back ahead of Jacartier Wright you know, as the top true freshman running back. We just saw a number of carries for Harry Trotter, of course. Not a lot of Tyler Burns inserted there. So I think as we're looking ahead two weeks out you know, with TCU, a lot of James Gilbert and then probably Harry Trotter, Joe Irvin would be the two and the three backs in my best estimation. That's where that position is at right now. Something I talked about on John Kurtz's show on K-Man the other day that I don't love talking about, he asked me to, to rank out, you know, what are the issues on K-State's offense right now or just K-State having success. And I said a position you really have to look at is tied in and fullback. And I think the stats I rattled off there was you've got a guy like Nick Linners with 151 snaps this year. You've got a guy like plays Gaming at 150. That's 301 between the two. Mason Bard is around 80. You have almost 400 snaps amongst, you know, skill. I know you don't think of tied in to fullback as skill position talent, but in this offense, that's what it is. So you've got almost 400 snaps from those guys, and I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but the PFF scores are something like 54, 48, and 46 for those three guys. So those are three of your top 10 snap getters outside of the offensive line and quarterback, and they're having rough years. So in an offense that we've you know talked so much about is going to be so dependent on getting good play from the fullbacks and tight ends, K-State simply isn't really getting that right now. That's not to say Nick Linders hasn't shown flashes as a guy who can make plays down the field one-on-one -on -one in the passing game. Doesn't mean Blaze Gammon hasn't shown flashes. He was open against Mississippi State for a touchdown, but Skyler Thompson missed him. Doesn't mean these guys can't do things for K-State. It means it's not happening consistently enough, and I think it's something people need to look at when they're looking at, oh, it's Skyler Thompson, or oh, it's play calling, or oh, it's not going for it on the fourth down. Those things are all factors. I don't disagree with any of that, but I think there's some more specific things that are happening um, beneath the surface or on the surface, depending on how close you're willing to look at it. 
that are causing causing issues for this offense. A group that did play better last week, as I mentioned, was the wide receivers. I thought if I was going to be you know really really blunt, if I had to you know point the finger at one group, it was probably them at Oklahoma State that had the hardest time, and that's why they had a wide receiver only meeting after that game. They knew they struggled. I didn't think they were perfect against uh, against Baylor, but significantly better. Phillip Brooks, seven catches, I believe, for 79 yards. Dalton Shunn, seven for 69. Both those guys were well over 70 on the PFF scores. And Phillip Brooks is a guy that you really think about it. We talk about young playmakers in this offense. We bring up Malik Knowles, who, of course, I'll mention in his, his injury situation here in a second. But you mention Malik Knowles. You look at a guy like Chris Heron. You look at a guy like Joshua Youngblood, of course, who's played a lot. We even talk about Keenan Garber, who's red shirt out of Lawrence Free State. We don't talk a lot about Phillip Brooks even though he's another freshman in that group. And he's a guy on the field quite a bit. He's your number one kick returner. He's your number one punt returner. He's getting as many targets. If you look at Chris Nelson's numbers, he's getting more targets as a pass catcher than any other receiver on the team. So he's a guy, when we're talking about future options, that receiver, I think I have to start including Phillip Brooks. But the position played better in general last week, as I said. The Malik Knowles situation, though, disappointing. You know, a guy who, who came back faster than we would have projected for sure after the injury suffered probably against Mississippi State, if not right before that. He did play uh, against Baylor. He did start. He did have the first four targets thrown at him from K-State, only one for one completion. I still get the sense he wasn't 100%. He did leave the game after just four, uh, I think, four offensive snaps for Malik Knowles, at least four targets, two series he was done. I don't want to speculate a whole lot about the injury for Malik Knowles, but I do think there's a chance the injury he left the Baylor game with was not the exact same injury he had going into it. So it may be more than one thing for Malik Knowles right now which you have to watch for. We've asked Chris Kleiman about it twice. He's been very transparent about it, but they don't really have an answer right now as to when Malik Knowles will be back. Let's wrap up the offense by looking at the offensive line. I think this is the group that a lot of people now have moved their focus from wide receiver if they're looking for who to blame and they're looking at the offensive line. It's never that simple. It's never one position group. It's not just the offensive line. But I think you watch weeks one through three, and this was a group um, that games one and two, they simply were better than their opponents and then played incredibly technically sound very consistent and were a much better team. Game three, they probably weren't better than Mississippi State physically speaking, but they still held their ground in that group. But if you start to look at the numbers, they started to struggle a little bit more. What we've seen in the last two games is this offensive line, which is something we talked about before the year. I'm not trying to go pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, we were right at first because we flip-flopped so many times. It's hard to really say, but this isn't an incredibly physically gifted offensive line. If you look at it from a recruiting perspective, a class ranking perspective, height, weight, all those kind of things. So as they've gotten into Big 12 play in Mississippi State, the way I've termed it is they're not, they're not really overachieving. They need to play better, too. I'm not saying that they're playing as well as they even can because they're not. But this is a group that needs to play a little bit better if this offense is going to overachieve a little bit, which is what you're asking of the whole unit, and it really starts up front. There were some questions asked in the presser this week you know, about perhaps changes to the units, not specifically the offensive line, but any group in general. Chris Kleiman was very clear that that's something they absolutely will consider. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if you saw shuffling on the offensive line. Josh Rivas, right or wrong, is the highest graded player by pro, by pro football focus for K-State. They just did a 91-5. That's an elite grade. He's K-State's sixth offensive lineman. So you wonder if he has a chance to replace a guy like Evan Curl, perhaps at one of the guard spots. I don't, from the eye test, think Rivas has been significantly better than Curl, at least in the last couple of games. I think that's really fallen off. But I could understand a suggestion of playing Josh Rivas there instead of Evan Curl. Kind of like the offensive line, a group that was really, really good through weeks one, two, and three. And unlike the offensive line, kind of dominated week three against Mississippi State. The defensive line has fallen off a little bit, I think. They were getting so much pressure with just four players, particularly even the defensive tackles with Jordan Mitty and Trey Deshaun as, as recently as that Mississippi State game. Wyatt Hebert was fantastic at Oklahoma State. It's not all about getting sacks and rushing the passer, but this group has started to drop off the last two games. Of course, you look at Chuba Hubbard running for nearly 300 yards against Oklahoma State. That's part of that. Baylor had a lot of success breaking tackles, not all against the defensive line, but they kept getting into the secondary, into the defensive backfield to have a chance to break tackles. So this is another group, like the offensive line, has to step up and play better. The difference between these two is I think the defensive line is physically gifted enough to do it as well. You look at Reggie Walker, preseason first team all Big 12 selection, Wyatt Hubert, who's probably the most talented player on K-State's roster, Trey Deshaun, a borderline all Big 12 player, Jordan Mitty, who's probably the most improved player on the roster, there's depth there, too, with Kyle Ball, Bronson, Massey. An interesting note, last game against Baylor was the first time I noticed Bronson Massey played more snaps 
than Kyle Ball. I believe he had 28 to 21. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but there was a bit of a, I think, a seven-snap difference between the two. So interesting to see Bronson Massey elevate himself a little bit. The point is there's a number of options there. And if you're going to pick at a unit that has talent that's probably not playing up to it, I wouldn't put that on Skyler Thompson. I wouldn't put that on the running backs. I wouldn't put that on the receivers. I wouldn't put that off the line. I'd probably look at the defensive line. This is a group that was probably most responsible for K-State winning at Mississippi State. And if they're going to start beating teams again later in the schedule that maybe on paper, at least at the skill positions, they're not as good as, I think the defensive line is going to need to play better for K-State. Linebacker, from a grading perspective, PFF does not really like what this group is doing. And it's funny because there's a lot of debate about whether or not PFF's a good, a good grading mechanism, and that's a whole different pers- a whole different argument. But I'll tell you a little story. Is, is Derek and I were sitting, I think it was last Sunday, watching NFL games, talking about the Baylor game, and Derek was the K-State's linebacker, and he's like, man, my perception of Eli Sullivan, for example, was he played hard, he was a sound tackler. When he got to the ball, he brought guys down but I felt like he missed fit a lot and wasn't in the right place in pass coverage. You go look at his PFF scores for Eli Sullivan for that game, for example, and Derek didn't know this before, you know, before he said that Sullivan scored a 78 on tackling, which is very high in their metrics. That means when he got to the ball, they thought he was a very sound tackler and very aggressive, but he was in the low fifties or high forties, both in pass coverage and in run support, which means they see him not in the right hole, not in the right fit and not being where he needs to be. So, This anecdote is telling you that Derek Young, who I will say I think knows as much about K-State football as anybody, and watched that game twice and had that feeling of Eli Sullivan, when these unrelated coaches go watch tape and give you a score that represents what that happens, that tells me these are pretty good scores. They're watching the tape. They know what's happening. But this is a group, too. Again, I could go through this whole group and say the same thing at every spot. They need guys to make plays on this defense. I think the linebackers are playing okay. I think they're playing very hard. I think they're better than they were a year ago. I think they're more athletic than they were a year ago. They're playing better. But for this defense, again, with an offense that's going to struggle to score points, to be bluntly, and this isn't even fair to ask of them, I'm going to be asking these position groups so to make more plays, whether they can turn over a team inside the red zone to give K-State an easy, a potentially easy score. Can you get a pick six? Can you get a strip sack fumble recovery for a touchdown? Again, that's a lot to expect of a position group, whether it's linebackers, defensive line, anybody. But I think that's what we need to see. And that would transition back to the defensive backfield as well, a group that I think has started – to come back down to earth a little bit. I think A.J. Parker is a fantastically talented football player, and he's still a good player, but he struggled the last two weeks with two really good receivers in Tylen Wallace and Denzel Mims. We just haven't seen a lot of game-changing play really from the secondary. I think the difference you could see in that group, another place where you talk about possible changes, I'd be surprised if Logan Wilson, you know, true freshman who's about to earn a redshirt next time he plays a game, I'd be surprised if he's not in the secondary against TCU. I don't think he's going to start. Um, or even be the number two corner, number three corner. But I think he's going to play. I think they're going to look at him. I think they're going to look at how much more can Jonathan Alexander play at a safety spot competing with Denzel Goolsby and Wayne Jones. I think the secondary is one they got to look across the board. They've gone with Daryl Patterson sometimes as their number two corner. Well, their top reserve, I should say, so the number three corner. Sometimes Kevion McGee. So I think there's some things still to be learned in the secondary. And it, like the rest of this defense, I think just has to find a way to make some big plays, to force some turnovers because the offense is going to need some of these breaks. I want to skip now to this looking game by game. I know I'm going really direct here, but it is just me today on the KSO show, so I'm going off some notes here at Tallgrass Tap House by myself. So I'm going to walk through the schedule now. I'm going to tell you guys how I see K-State finishing this season out. I have the right to change these. I'm not somebody who believes that I'm going to pick a team to go 6-6 six and six and stick with it the rest of the year. That was my record before the year. I may change it, and if you want to call me on it, that's totally fine. And I'm just projecting out what I think would happen as these teams are constructed right now and then also taking into account what I'm thinking is going to happen down the line. I look at this TCU game coming up on October, October 19th, excuse me. Not as a must win. You could argue with me on that, particularly when we get to the end of my schedule prediction. You could say it really was a must win. I don't think it is. I think K-State can go to a bowl game, not will, but can go to a bowl game without beating TCU. But let's be honest, it's really, really important. It feels incredibly different to go into uh, the Oklahoma game at 4-2 and two versus 3-3. Three and three. Those two records give you your fan base a significantly different feel for the season, too. So it's a huge game. Right now, I do think K-State will beat TCU at home. I think it will be very difficult. I think it will be very low scoring. But I think the Horn Frogs offense is the worst K-State has seen since the non-conference schedule. I think the Wildcat defense will have a chance to hold this team perhaps under 20 points. And the offense has to make some plays. I think Gary Patterson's defense will still be tough. You know they'll be fast. They're not as good as they typically are, or they are in their great years. But it will still be a challenge. But I'm giving K-State a win over TCU. That moves the Wildcats to forward, too. 
We follow that up with the Oklahoma game in Manhattan. I'm a big believer in the Sooners. I think they're a college football playoff team. I think K-State loses that game to fall to 4-3. and three. If you're 4-3, and three, you're going to Lawrence with another quote-unquote you know, must-win type game. Anytime you're playing KU, it feels like a must-win, especially when it's the first year of Chris Kleiman and, and Les Miles. I think this is a more competitive game than some K-State fans want to acknowledge. I don't think it's a sure thing. I do think K-State's the better team, though. I think they're going to be a significantly better coached. I will take K-State to win in Lawrence and go to 5-3. and three. I will follow it up with a loss on the road to Texas and Austin. I'm not as nearly as high on Texas as I am Oklahoma. I don't think they're nearly as explosive, but the game's in Austin. They're still a very, very good football team. They impressed me against a really good LSU team. I can't reasonably give K-State a win in that one. They're falling to 5-4. and four. After that, on November 16th, you've got West Virginia at home. If you're going to go to a bowl game, you've got to beat West Virginia at home. The TCU one, again, I can understand. Maybe you're not going to do it. I can understand that. I can understand some of the other games being toss-ups. West Virginia is not a bad football team either. They've done some impressive things. They played with Texas. Uh, they've beat Kansas in Lawrence in league play. They've got a win over NC State in non-conference. But K-State has to beat Neil Brown and West Virginia at home, or else getting to a bowl will be very, very, very troublesome. I've got that as K-State's sixth win. So I've got K-State at six and four after beating West Virginia at home with two games left, going to face Matt Wells and Texas Tech in Lubbock on November 23rd. That's one day after my son's birthday. Right now, I think this is the hardest game for me to pick on the schedule. I'm giving that to Texas Tech. I think the Red Raiders deserve a lot of credit for beating a lot of credit for beating Oklahoma State after Oklahoma State beat K-State. Jet Duffy had a really nice game for Texas Tech at quarterback. I think K-State can win at Texas Tech. I think this is a winnable, winnable road game. That's my son talking in the background. I apologize. I think it's a winnable road game, but I have K-State losing it to fall to 6-5. and five. And then get ready to get mad at me because I have now flip-flopped on this game for about the 20th time. I have Iowa State beating K-State on November 30th in Manhattan to close the season. That would leave K-State at 6-6 six and six and still go into a bowl game. I don't think Iowa State is world, world beaters. They're not getting the nine wins this year that they so desperately want to achieve for the first time in school history. But I think they have improved the last couple of weeks and show me some things. Right now, as they're playing, I think Iowa State's a better team than K-State, so I will pick them to beat K-State. So that has K-State 6-6, six and six, where I have them tracking. That is what I had them going before the season. I came off that to jump up with seven or eight wins after beating Mississippi State. Now I'm back down to six after the, well, after my projection here against Iowa State. We'll see what happens there, though. Now, but you can go back to this, that first game against TCU and say, well, Matt, it's a must win because you only have them winning six games, including a win over TCU. So I certainly understand your line of thinking if that's how you're looking at this. But I think how every game, um, the outcome of every game affects every other game. I don't know if K-State needs to beat either Texas Tech or Iowa State to get a six win and go to a bowl game that they don't find one of those late in the late in the season. I think everything changes everything. So that's why I have it the way it is. I'm back to six wins for K-State, which I still believe would be a successful season for the Wildcats. I'm going to wrap up this second segment of the KSO show brought to you by People State Bank and Legacy Insurance with a little bit of football recruiting talk. I'm not going to do much of it because Derek Young's better at it. And like I said in segment one for this kind of stuff, I'd love for you to some come subscribe to our website and read it on there. So I'll just keep it very, very generic for the Wildcats right now. If I were a fan following K-State recruiting, I would keep an eye out on some 2021 prospects. K-State's getting pretty close to starting uh, that season of recruiting as well, which will be neat to see this early in the process to have a name or two added to the class of 2021. I would keep a look at a local running back. You probably know who that is. And I would watch you know, the junior college ranks for the 2020 class, the running back junior college ranks. I think there's some guys in there that can add relatively soon to the 2020 class before you get added into 2021. And the junior colleges in general, you might have a couple of kids, that's a couple of names that pop up as commits within the next couple of weeks, but they may not be the only ones. This could be a class that goes from, I thought, K-State taking two or three JUCOs, maybe five or six. I think there's some spots, particularly along the defensive line, and maybe even at wide receiver and tight end where K-State would like to find some help. But Derek Young can tell you more about that at K-State Online. Uh, would love you to subscribe there and give us a shot if you are not. I think that's going to wrap it up for me for this one-man edition of the KSO Show. Really, really appreciate the help at Tallgrass Tap House, as always. They've been fantastic for us. Red said, tell your friends nine times um, off air, and he's really, really ready to do it. So for me, who's by myself calling this, Natalie Hall, who had dinner with me. I really appreciate that. Red Hall. Red, can you tell him? Tell your friends.